Okay, folks, we're going to make a start. Chapter in question is chapter 7, page 852 in your hymnal, page 852. Of God's covenant with man. We're not got time to read through the whole thing because I'm going to survey the passage before us. But let's begin with uh, a word of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we consider now your great condescension, your great love towards us, your people, we pray that you will inflame our hearts with love, that we will desire to serve and honor you, and that the glory of Christ revealed to us uh, will uh, inspire us, Lord, to do. Uh, good things and good works for your great name. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, chapter 7. Um, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions today so we can have a bit of fun, or at least I'm going to have a bit of fun. You might not be, but uh, um, uh, give me the two major covenants in Scripture. There are many covenants, but the two major covenants in Scripture. Shout them out. Covenant of grace and covenant of works. Good. Which came first? Okay. Very good. You all passed. Go home now. Actually, there's debate about that second answer, but we won't go into it right now. <laughs> okay. God's covenant with man. Uh, if you'll turn uh, in your hymn books, page 852, um, I want to give you a quick outline of the chapter, chapter 7. Clearly, we've got uh, six paragraphs, which we can't hope to go over in any significant detail. But I hope to give you a flavor, first of all, of the covenant of works. And then secondly, um, I'm going to ask you, you're going to close your um, uh, uh, confessions and hymn books. You're not going to look at them. And then I'm going to ask you questions about the covenant of grace. So we have before us in this chapter the covenant of grace uh, and, uh, sorry, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. The first two paragraphs deal with the covenant of works and paragraphs three through six deal with the covenant of grace. Now that's not to say those are the only two covenants in Scripture. Uh, there are many covenants in Scripture, certainly between God and man, but largely when we're talking about those other major covenants between God and man, we're talking about covenants which fit under the rubric in one way or another of the covenant of grace. What other covenants do we have when we're talking about the covenant of grace? What are the covenants which in some way form part of the revelation of the covenant of grace? Shout them out. Can't hear you. Noahic? Abrahamic? Mosaic, Davidic, the new. Okay, um, of course, there's 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 some debate about whether the Noahic covenant forms part of the covenant of grace, or whether that's in a sense a recapitulation of the creation covenant. Um, you can take or leave that uh, argument or discussion if you want. Um, and the Mosaic covenant, again, there's some uh, debate about whether that is a reflection in some way, or a republication of the covenant of works. Um, I'm not going to get into that today. If you want to talk to me about it uh, uh, again, uh, you can. But generally, what we're dealing with today is the covenant of works, and then in chapter paragraphs 3 through 6, the covenant of grace. So let's look at the covenant of works, first of all. Um, I'm using somebody else's outline here, so the alliteration is, is not my own doing, but I think it's actually helpful. In paragraph one, we see that there is a great distance between God and man. We also see that there is a great debt uh, that man owes God in terms of obedience. Uh, also, a great disability, uh, man uh, not able to achieve fruition of God by uh, anything other than God's condescension, uh, a great descent, which speaks about the condescension uh, of God in covenant, which we'll look at in a minute, a great dividend, what was promised in the covenant of life, and also a great demand. What was demanded in the covenant of life was perfect, and uh, covenant of works perfect and perpetual 
obedience. So that's one way. As I said, the, the, the points are not mine, but I believe they're all there. That's one way of remembering the essentials of the covenant of works. There's a great distance, first of all. The confession says the distance between God and the creature is so great they could never have any fruition of him but by some voluntary condescension on God's part which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. Okay? There's a great distance between God and the creature. I think we need to understand that the way that's overcome in the covenant of works is by way of covenant. That's what the confession says. Um, it can only be overcome by some voluntary condescension. Is that in voluntary condescension on God's part? Notice it's not using the language of grace, but voluntary condescension on God's part. What is a covenant? We need to understand what that is in order to understand the nature of this voluntary condescension. Well, a covenant's a contract uh, or a compact. A contract between two parties. And there are in a covenant stipulations laid upon both uh, parties. Now, usually in covenants, the parties are equal. So you and I might enter into a covenant uh, that I agree to pay a certain amount of money for a certain service, provided that would effectively be a covenant. And, and if one of us failed to meet those obligations, you didn't provide the service or I didn't provide the, the finances, uh, there would be some kind of stipulations result, uh, relating to penalties. So there's obligations and promises with threats, as it were, attached to those penalties. Usually, in Scripture, they're between equal parties. What do we notice here about the covenant of works? It's not between equal parties. In fact, any covenant God makes with his people, uh, there is an inherent inequality in that relationship. Now, given that there's an inequality between God and man, um, uh, given there's an inequality between God and man, what are the implications for the covenant structures and stipulations? What's the implication right from the start? Usually we'll agree to a covenant and all its penalties and stipulations and obligations. The two parties will agree What's the implication for the covenant of works and every other subsequent divine covenant when the parties are not equal? Speak up. Okay, the greater party, the superior, has the greater capacity to affect uh, the covenant? Yes. What else? Right, very good. Both of them are true. The covenant that God makes with his people, God dictates the terms. He says, this is the way it is, and this is the way you're going to do it. Uh, and yes, there are uh, also, very importantly, especially when it comes to the covenant of grace, but also the covenant of works, um, uh, that uh, God also has the greater capacity and, and, in some sense, responsibility in the covenant of grace to bring about the terms of the covenant. So it's very important we understand that. God sovereignly imposes the conditions of the covenant upon man because he is simply the greater party. He gets to do that, and that's just life. That's just life. That's the way it is. God is at liberty to do that. So, biblical covenants between God and man are between unequal parties. Then we see there's a great uh, debt. Uh, we read this in the Confession. Reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator. Remember, uh, the Confession has just said we can't have any fruition or blessedness of God unless there is a condescension from God to us. Uh, and yet we still owe by creation, not even by covenant, but by creation and by covenant, we owe that perfect obedience. Adam owed such perfect and perpetual obedience before God. Now we can talk about the nature of the terms of the covenant of works. We often think about merit when we talk about the covenant of works. 
We're opposing their works and grace, as we see done in Scripture. We are not saved by works. No man is justified by works of the law, says Paul. You are saved by grace, says the apostle. So there's a, an opposition between works and grace uh, in these two covenants. And yet it's interesting to note that when God sets up the covenant of works, he is not setting up a covenant based on strict merit. Okay, really important to understand that. In Roman Catholic theology, uh, I think there's some, it has some bearing upon what we're saying now. There's three kinds of merits, strict, condign, and congruent uh, merit. Strict merit is where um, you reward me according to the nature of the work I've done. So very, in a quid pro quo sense, what I've done deserves what you give me. God commanded Adam to obey him, and he would confirm him in his estate of sonship and life perpetually. And yet obedience is not, obedience for that reward is not really strict uh, merit. Um, it's really what we're saying here is that God decides to reward based upon his gracious, loving character, the acts of obedience of Adam in this covenant structure. So when we talk about merit, we need to be very careful. Even in the covenant of works, Adam strictly did not merit life, or the terms were not set up that he would strictly merit life, because the reward was greater than the act. You understand that? The reward was greater than the act. Condign merit is where the reward is, is owed, uh, but is not properly earned. And congruent merit is where the reward is neither earned nor owed, but still given. Um, again, I, I, I gave this example, I think, in, in a sermon a few weeks back. Your child comes to you with a picture, um, and, and you say, great, wonderful horse, and it's actually, you know, it, 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 it's it's something completely different it, it's a, a mountain or whatever it looks nothing like a mountain and yet you still love it you still cherish it you still put it on the fridge you still give them the reward in a sense even though their labors don't strictly merit what they've done you do that with your children all the time if you've had children you reward them in a sense over and above what they have done in and of themselves that's what God essentially does with Adam he says that on the basis of your perpetual and perfect obedience which is not worthy enough actually because otherwise you wouldn't need what i just said a few moments ago that act of condescension if if adam strictly could merit um eternal life then there would not have been condescension it would have simply been a, a straightforward business transaction you do this i'll do this because that's what it's worth but no god is condescending He's coming down. He's stooping down to Adam's level and saying, here's the deal. I will reward you and all those after you that are in you with life on the basis of your perfect and perpetual obedience. Notice the confession speaks not of grace concerning this relationship. It speaks of voluntary condescension. Not of grace, but of voluntary condescension. The language of grace in Scripture and in the Confession is largely reserved for the covenant of grace. So we're not saying that God was gracious in that sense, though, though very clearly he is. But the Confession has used its language very carefully. The act of God of entering into covenant with Adam was an act of voluntary condescension. Why are they maintaining that distinction between voluntary condescension and grace. Why did they not just say, um, yet they could never any fruition of him as their blessedness, but by some act of grace on God's part? Why are they not using the word grace? Okay, very good. Absolutely. They're trying to maintain a works principle. Not necessarily strict merit, but we can call it merit if you want. That's fine by me. I'm not going to get worked up by using the word merit. Some will, but I'm not going to. Because we need to maintain that there is a works principle in the covenant of works. God said, you must do this. And in the day that you don't do this, you'll surely die. 
that's a works principle which in Scripture is set over and against the grace principle by which we are saved. Is everyone following me on that? If you're not, shake your head. Because we can stop and pause. Okay. And don't get hung up on either on the, the, the kinds of merit. Um, I'm not saying that's what we're importing here. That's more, that is more Roman Catholic theology. But uh, it's, it's helpful to be aware of those distinctions. There's also a great disability in Adam. They could never have any fruition of the, him as their blessedness. We're talking here about the creator-creature distinction. That there is, between God and man, a gap so vast that unless God chose to condescend, to come down, man could never reach up. I'm going to uh, read a quote from a man called Adolf von Harnack tonight, in tonight's sermon, um, who talks about the infinite value of the human soul. He's a German liberal theologian in the 19th century, who talks about the soul of man being so ennobled that it does reach up and unite with God. That's the entire that's entirely opposite to the testimony of Scripture. It's not the soul of man that reaches up. It, it's the heart of God that comes down. So we need to understand that very clearly. Even in his pre-fall state, even in his unfallen state, Adam required an act of great condescension. And, and that's what's meant by the idea of a great descent. God descended. God came down. Um. I have a quote here from A. A. Hodge. The very act of creation brings the creature under obligation to the creator, but it cannot bring the creator into obligation to the creature. Creation itself, being a single act of grace, cannot endow the beneficiary with a claim for more grace. Well, he's saying there, yes, God was, was condescended in creation. He didn't need to create us. He's full of life, blessedness, and glory in and of himself. He doesn't need any more from us. Can't add any more glory to him. Um, and so that's an act of grace. But that doesn't mean that God is then obligated to retain a gracious disposition towards us. And so he establishes the covenant of works. There's a great payoff, if you like, a dividend. The first covenant wherein life was promised to Adam, says our confession. There's the great dividend, life. Very complicated area. We can't get into all of it. Created um, with life, with righteousness, with holiness. My estimation is in a probationary period under the covenant of works, whereby as he obeys, he maintains his obedience, he is at some point confirmed in his status as son with eternal life with no possibility of falling. That's what is being spoken of here. I haven't got time to go into what Voss writes on that. But not only for him, but for his posterity also. Remember, he's a representative of God's people. And so what happens to him in some way happens to those who come from him by ordinary generation. There's also, as we saw, a great demand. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Elsewhere, we'll read the word perpetual, ongoing obedience. That was the demand of God, and he had every right to do that. It's implicit by the very nature of, of the negative prohibition, do not do this, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. It's also revealed to us this great demand in the life of Christ, the second Adam, who comes and fulfills what the first Adam could not do, keeps the law perfectly, provides life. And so Christ comes to us in the covenant of grace to fulfill the terms of the covenant of works. You understand that? Christ comes to us in the covenant of grace in order that he might fulfill the terms of the covenant of works. That's why he's called the second Adam. Because the first Adam failed, the second Adam has come and has done that task. This is, this is not even 40,000 feet overview. This is outer space. I understand this. Um, we simply can't get into the details uh, any more, but any quick questions on the covenant of works before we move on?
Bruce. Mm, very much so. Yeah. Very good. Anyone else? All right, close your confessions. If you've got it electronically, close it. It's my time to ask the questions now. Oh, just one thing before we get there. Larger Catechism, question 17, just to sum up this, okay? Don't forget your confession is interpreted by shorter and larger catechism. Larger catechism 17, how did God create man? After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, formed the body of the man of the dust of the ground, and the woman of the rib of the man, endued them with living, reasonable, and immortal souls. Notice that, immortal souls. And made them, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, having the law of God written in their hearts, and power to fulfill it, and dominion over the creatures, yet subject to fall. That speaks about the kind of creature that God entered into covenant with. Um, in the covenant of works. Now, close your confessions, if you will. Oh, no, one more. Let's do larger catechism 21 as well. We'll get there, don't worry. Did man continue in that estate wherein God at first created him? Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, through the temptation of Satan, transgressed the commandment of God in eating the forbidden fruit, and thereby fell from the estate of innocency, wherein they were created. And did all mankind fall in that transgression? And that's the idea there of Adam as the public representative, not only the biological, but also the covenantal representative. All mankind descending from him by ordinary generation, which excludes Christ, sinned in him and fell with him in that first transgression. So, right, now you can close your confessions. Question time. Could Adam, after the fall, be made righteous under the covenant of works? And what I'm going to do here is ask questions based upon the confession, chapters 7, 3 through 6. So all these answers are going to come straight out of the confession. So, could Adam, after the fall, be made righteous under the covenant of works? What's the answer? No. Why? Okay, the covenant was broken. Okay, covenant's broken. Man, by his fall, this is the confession, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant. So the covenant's broken. Uh, until our Lord comes, it's no one else uh, can then be saved by it. So by what arrangement can, uh, can, can man then be saved? covenant of grace good it pleased god to make did i put it up there <laughs> technology you don't get any marks for that i have to be more careful with my clicker let's do it again oh i can't it it, it, it came up with the answer it came up with the question editing error all right what is the ultimate cause of this covenant, the covenant of grace? What's the ultimate cause of it? Mercy, grace, anything else? Sorry? God? Yeah. Confession says it pleased God to make a second commonly called the covenant of grace. I can see if I've made more editing errors now, I'm, the whole thing's going to, it's not going to work. Okay, what is offered to sinners in this covenant of grace? Okay, eternal life. Sorry? Eternal life on condition of obedience. Sorry? New nature. Forgiveness, reconciliation, yeah, all those are summed up. And the confession adds two very important words. So everything that you've said and more, so the whole nine yards, 
He offers unto, uh, offers unto sinners life and salvation in Christ. It's very important that you think of your salvation as being bound up in Christ. And I say it very often from the pulpit, what we have by the grace of God is ours because of union with Christ. Christ himself is offered in this covenant. Christ himself is offered. And what he is, just as it was with Adam, becomes what is true for us. So as he is righteous, we receive that. As he is holy, likewise. Sonship, likewise. Okay, so very important. Is God compelled to do such, to enter into the covenant of grace? No. Confession says he freely offers unto sinners life. Okay? So we're talking about grace here is a free act of God, not obligated in any way, shape, or form to rescue us from sin. It, the ultimate cause of this covenant is the pleasure of God, and so he does as he wills. Okay, what does God require of us that we may be saved? You'd better get this right. Can't hear you. You have to shout out loud if you've got an answer. Faith in Christ alone. Good. Requiring of them faith in him. Okay? Faith. Not works. Okay? That's the works grace principle that is set at odds in Scripture. Not to say there is no place for works. And it doesn't deny the need for Christ's works either. Remember, Christ comes to us in the covenant of grace to fulfill what? The what? Covenant of works. That's right. Shout it out. The covenant of works. So the covenant of works is do this and live. Yeah? Christ did it and lived. That's why we live under the covenant of grace. How is that faith brought to pass? Can't hear you. You've got to shout out loud. Okay. Anything else? Yep, good. And the Holy Spirit is what really the confession focuses on promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. What name is frequently given to the covenant of grace in Scripture? The New Testament. Very good. Okay, the covenant of grace is frequently set forth in Scripture by the name of Testament. This is all the confession. I'm not using anything in my own language. Every answer is the confession. Testament. So we have in our scriptures the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. Okay? Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. We have more than that, of course, but uh, at the coming of Christ, the practices, not the principles but the practices of the old covenant pass away. The new covenant in principle is no different to the old covenant. We understand that? Everything you see in the Old Testament, you see also in the New Testament. It looks different. It's practiced differently. But in principle, it's the same, the same way of working. Okay, where are we? So... One name is frequently given. The covenant is testament. Why is this such? Why is the covenant of grace called a testament or a new testament? Okay. Which makes Christ the what? Testator, correct? Anything else? Is he the only one who receives... Is, well, he, <laughs> it's interesting. He, he's the testator and he is the recipient in a real sense. With whom is the covenant of grace made? This is a freebie. It's not up there. Who's the covenant of grace made with? Leo, you know the Shorter Catechism, don't you? You better today. <laughs> Anyone, with whom is the covenant of grace made? Covenant of grace is made with Christ. <laughs> well done. Christ. And the elect in him. So the covenant, really, of grace, yes, we've talked about it being in time. If the covenant of grace is also made with Christ, we must be talking about an eternal arrangement as well. What's often called the covenant of redemption. 
and there's debate whether the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace are two different things. I tend to think they are, but they, 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 they're two different covenants. One's an eternal and, and a covenant between Father, Son, and Spirit, and the other is uh, a covenant made in time with Christ as the representative of man. So the confession says, why is it called testament? In reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance which all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. What are the two ages under which this covenant was administered? Yes. Confession uses the language law and gospel, but it's the same thing as Dicker said, law and grace. This covenant was administered in the time of law uh, and in the time of the gospel. Now, I've edited it there. Is the covenant of grace administered in the same way under the law and under the gospel? Is the covenant of grace administered in the same way? Okay, now I'm being a bit ambiguous there. So I'll leave the question ambiguous so we can explore it. Is the covenant of grace administered in the same way under law as it is under gospel? No. Explain. Very good. So that's the answer, and we've got the uh, follow-up question. How was the covenant administered under law? And Dick has gone some way to explaining that. Under the law, it was administered. The covenant of grace was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifice, circumcision, the paschal lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, listen, all for signifying Christ to come. All right, so type, shadow, and promise is the manner in which the covenant of grace is administered in the old covenant. Type, shadow, promise. We ask then, what is the substance of the Old Testament types? Well, we know the answer because it's just told us. The confession says, under the gospel, when Christ, the substance, was exhibited. So you put those two questions together. The last answer there all for signifying Christ to come under the gospel when Christ the substance was exhibited. You ought not to be surprised then to, exp- to find Christ in every page of the Old Testament. That ought to be no surprise to you. Quite apart from this reality, he's the mediator of the covenant. Okay? And just on that fact alone, you ought to be unsurprised to find Christ on every, every page. What then are the ordinances of the new covenant. We're going to be very quick because we're running out of time. What are the ordinances of the new covenant? Baptism of the Lord's Supper and preaching. So our confession says, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments of baptism, and the Lord's Supper. For what were those old covenant forms, types, and shadows sufficient and effective? In other words, what did they do? And let's say what they didn't do as well. Okay, let's start by saying what they didn't do. Not for salvation. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We understand that. But, the confession says, they were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation and is called the Old Testament. Very important. Okay, the key phrases here... They're sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith. To instruct and build up in faith. That is to say, the confession, echoing the previous 
passage, Hebrews 10.4, does not say that they actually took away sins. Okay? But rather, pointing to the promised Messiah by whom they had full remission of sins. So the idea that people were saved in the Old Covenant in a way different to the New Covenant is entirely wrong. There's only ever been one way to be saved. That's by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, well, I'll just read these. Compare the ordinances of the Old Covenant to the ordinances of the New Covenant. And it's an interesting, interesting statement. The ordinances of the New Covenant, which, though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy, all that pertains to Christ. So there's a lot more going on in the Old Testament. If we were all covenant Christians, we'd be sacrificing non-stop, we'd be cleansing ourselves non-stop, we'd be going to feast non-stop, which doesn't sound too bad. Um, but the, the New Covenant, it, it's just a bit more simple. It's a lot more simple, but more full. More full. Why? Because the fulfillment of those things has come, and we have Christ before us. Oh, I think I've just finished. Yes, I've just finished. Okay. So, interesting way just to look at the covenant of grace. Um, and I commend you to go home and, and, uh, uh, and read that section on the covenant of grace. Covenant of grace is not plan B because Adam failed in plan A. Okay? We need to just understand that. God doesn't have plan Bs. He knows the end from the beginning. God in his supreme mercy and grace gives unto us in the covenant of grace that which we lost and failed in the covenant of works. And in, in the covenant of grace we have Christ and life eternal. We are to be greatly thankful to our God. Let's pray. We bless and magnify you for grace. We bless and magnify you for our Savior we bless and magnify you for your kindness. How we thank you, Lord, for Christ. May we love you more. May we trust you more. May we serve you more on the basis of these truths. We thank you, Lord God. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.